All right, ladies and gentlemen, excited for the next debate. So first I'm gonna introduce our speakers then I'm going to hand it off to Amy, the moderator. So the biography for Michael Jones, who is a graduate student in the, in the philosophy program at the University of Arizona. He is the founder and president of Inspiring Philosophy Ministries, a Christian apologetics organization. Moreover, introducing Thomas, AKA Holy Kool-Aid. Thrilled to have you here as well, Thomas. Thomas is the leader of the YouTube channel, Holy Kool-Aid, with hundreds of thousands of subscribers and the organizer of the Faithless Forum. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. I'm going to hand it over to Amy, our moderator for the debate, who will share the format as well as get us started. Thanks so much, Amy. Thank you so very much, James, and everyone here at DebateCon 2022. And tonight's format is going to be 15 minute openings for each followed by eight minute rebuttals back and forth, 24 minutes of open dialogue or discussion, and 25 minutes of Q&A with a final wrap up of closing statements from both sides. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Holy Cooley for their up to 15 minute opening. Thank you. Before I begin, I want to thank my opponent, Michael Jones, for agreeing to this debate. Uh, Michael's channel and mine both take very similar approaches, making laser-focused, heavily researched videos, breaking down complex topics, albeit on opposite sides of the religious aisle. I don't believe that either of us are married to our positions, but we would prefer to go wherever the truth leads, and I greatly respect that about Mike. I'd also like to quickly thank Modern Day Debate, Bob Russell and Amy Newman, and um, James Kuntz, for organizing and hosting and moderating this event and this debate. And finally, I'd like to thank each and every one of you guys for coming out here today to watch, learn, and challenge your own positions. Or just watch me get creamed, let's be honest. If that's the case, you did pick a good day to come out here if you're coming to watch me get creamed because this is my first ever in-person debate. And three days ago, my doctor advised me against coming out here because I am still recovering from a motorcycle accident. He thought that it wouldn't be fair. I told my doctor that I know it's still not a fair fight, but I'm not really sure what other advantages I can possibly give Michael to even the odds. This is an incredible thing that we're able to do, to come out here and disagree publicly, openly, and peacefully. Because while Mike and I disagree on some things, we're both able to agree in freedom of expression, as well as freedom of and from religion, as it's written into this nation's great constitution. And that's part of what makes this country awesome. In many areas, Mike and I share a common goal. We both believe in evolution by natural selection, or at least evolution. Um, we both believe, neither one of us thinks that the earth is 6,000 years old. Neither of us believes in a global flood or that the Old Testament laws need to necessarily be followed. And neither of us believes in a future antichrist or tribulation or literal eternal torturous hellfire for those who don't believe. In many ways, I think Michael's interpretation of Christianity is less dangerous than that held by the majority of Christians today. And that's great. But it's far from the only one. And today's topic, the debate topic is, is Christianity dangerous? I, I wanna make sure that we're not talking past each other. So we first need to determine what we mean by Christianity. If you were to ask a Jehovah's Witness, uh, Bob Jones University and the Westboro Baptist Church all to separately come up with a definition of Christianity, you'd likely get widely varied definitions, which often include themselves while excluding wide swaths of other believers as not true Christians. I don't think that this is the way to go about it because it's not really for us to judge who is and isn't a true Christian. So I prefer to go with a more academic and far more inclusive definition. Cambridge defin... What is it on? There, there it goes. Oh, okay. Cambridge Dictionary defines Christianity as a religion based on belief in God and on the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and on the Bible. By this widely held definition, there are over 2.38 billion Christians on planet Earth. Granted, there are thousands of different denominations. It is a gigantic tapestry. There's all different flavors. You have Catholics, Greek and Russian Orthodox, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Episcopalians, Anglicans, Pentecostals, and I could go on for hours, countless others. You can believe in predestination as the Calvinists do, or free will, and yet both are part of this great tapestry. You can believe in salvation through faith alone, based on Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, or based on James chapter 2, you can believe that faith without works is dead. Both of these positions are still a part of this massive tapestry. Christianity includes Christianity includes both 
those who believe it for their own sake or for its own sake and those who follow the Bible to get external recognition, to find community or to gain rewards from other Christians. So long as their religious identity is based on the life and teachings of Jesus, a belief in God or on the Bible or, and on the Bible, then they fall into this definition. They fit the criteria of Christian. These are the three legs of the stool that makes up Christianity, that, or that Christianity rests on. And today, we're here to analyze the stool of Christianity. So let's get to examining and determine if there are any clear and present dangers. I need to, all right. Now, I need to stress that we're not here to debate whether or not Christianity is true. Something doesn't have to be false to be dangerous. We're not here we're not here to determine if Christianity is beneficial. Um, something can be, or we're not here to debate whether or not Christianity is beneficial or can, can result in good or positive outcomes. We're not even here to talk about whether or not Christianity has a net positive or negative effect on people's health or well-being. We're debating whether or not it's dangerous. For example, Nuclear power has tremendous benefits to society, providing clean energy to millions of people and has even been used as a power source in outer space missions. But it would be foolhardy to ignore the inherent dangers with nuclear power, and that's why nuclear engineers have created safeguards at every single nuclear reactor currently in use. Lastly, we're not here to talk about religion in general and the positive or negative effects that it can have on society. We're specifically focusing on Christianity and whether or not Christianity is dangerous. Anything else is irrelevant. So, is Christianity dangerous? Well, first we have to determine how we figure out if something is or isn't dangerous. Fortunately for us, neither Michael nor I have to create our own standard. The United States government is constantly in the business of risk assessment, and as an authority on the topic has developed a very clear three-step process of assessing risk. Step one, you identify the hazard. This could be something like a fire, a tornado, terrorism, a cyber attack, a pandemic, etc. You look at the probability and magnitude of the effect. Has this happened before? What's the likelihood of it happening again? Once you've identified the hazard, you step, move to step two. What are the assets that are at risk? Vulnerability assessment. Are people at risk? Property, including buildings? Is it a supply chain? Is it your regulatory and contractual obligations that are at risk? Once you figure out what's at risk, what is the impact on what's at risk? Impact analysis is step three. It could be casualties. It could be property damage. It could be the interruption of your business, etc. You get the point. So once you've done that, we have to ask ourselves, can we take that and apply it to Christianity? Well, I think the first thing that we have to do is look at specific beliefs. When we're trying to figure out if something is dangerous, let's find something that's in common with the vast majority of Christians. I know that this is a bit of an old poll, but in 1996, Time and CNN uh, polled a, a wide audience, and now granted this is back when a lot more people in America were Christian than they are today, but this audience included non-believers and believers alike, and they found that 82% of those surveyed believed in the power of, uh, the personal power of prayer to heal. Now, if you factor into the fact that there were atheists, agnostics, and non-believers in the mix with that, then you, it, it can only be determined from these facts. I think it'd be fair to assert that that statistic is likely higher among believers than the population as a whole. That's a fairly high percentage. Is this belief Christian? Well, it certainly has roots in the Bible. For starters, you have verses like Exodus 23, 25, worship the Lord your God and his blessing will be on your food and water, and I will... T or, uh, I will take away sickness from you. Mark 5, 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. The, if you're looking for faith healing, it's faith that led to the healing. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. James 5, 16. The prayer of a righteous man has great power as it is working. Mark 11, 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you shall receive it and it will be yours. Matthew 10, 1, and he called to him and his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal every disease and affliction. James 5, 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. All right, so it's, it's clear that from these verses, you may say that some of them are taken out of context. You may say that, well, you know, you're 
misunderstanding the original Greek or you know, the original Hebrew, and that's fine. But the fact of the matter is that based on these verses, the vast majority of Christians have come to the conclusion that, that uh, faith healing is possible, that there's some type of divine power in prayer. Okay, so is, does this bear out in reality? Well, according to a 2002 study by Dr. Um, Avales, he found that when, when he took a, a number of groups and had um, intercessory prayer over them, he found that each patient in the prayer group that received prayer for at least a week um, had of daily prayer from five different people had no statistical significant results after 26 weeks. Another study, 2005, Dr. Krukoff and colleagues found that prayer did not improve the outcomes of um, percutaneous coronary interventions in any significant way. Another study, in um, this one's from 2000, I believe five, from uh, Dr. John Austin and colleagues, found that prayer, uh, whether it was done by a professional faith healer or by a nurse or no one at all in the control group, he found no detectable effect of prayer in um, benefits towards AIDS patients. Lastly, um, a massive study that was actually funded by the Templeton Foundation, which is a Christian organization, um, did a massive study of thousands of different uh, people who were prayed over and found no benefit from prayer for those who didn't know that they were being prayed over. And for those who knew that they were being prayed over, whether it was because of pressure or whatever reason, they found that they actually fared worse. And they demonstrated worse recovery among uh, cardiac uh, bypass patients. And yet you have people like this, Peter Popoff. How many of you are familiar with Peter Popoff? This man was a faith healer with thousands of followers um, in the, the late uh, 20th century. And he would go around and he would hold these gigantic revival meetings and he would you know, pray, he'd, he'd reach out to the audience and says, I, I hear on such and such street there's this woman who has uh, lung cancer. And he'd call her out by name and he, she'd come to the front and he'd pray over her and, and she'd be weeping and it, it was this spectacle to behold. There were a number of tricks that he would use, and he eventually was exposed by a magician named James Randi. He had an earpiece in his ear. His wife would collect prayer cards with different people's information on them and then read the information over a radio receiver to him. James Randi, and, uh, as well as a uh, private investigator, set up a um, box to detect the radio frequencies, caught the, the video live, caught the audio live, paired the two together. Peter Popoff was word for word repeating what was going through the audio signal. This man, after this was made public on Johnny Carson, he went bankrupt, only to come back a, a decade or two later, and now he's still pulling the, the same charade, and he's, he's a multimillionaire um, evangelical, uh, what's it called, a uh, prosperity doctrine pastor. Now you might say he's not a true Christian. The problem here, the danger with this isn't that someone like Peter Popoff is that the Bible leads to Peter Popoff. The problem is that these verses set people up to be able to fall for cons like this. He's not alone. There's a documentary called Marjo, it won an Academy Award back in the 70s, where a young um, pastor, evangelical pastor, went around using um, faith healing methods, various tricks, and would get massive audiences to come in, collect, you know, pass the offering, play it around, collect massive amounts of money, and then book it to the next town. People think that they're healed, they throw away their medication, and then they go and die of cancer. It's, it's problems like this, that it's verses like these that I've shown you that set people up to become made marks, to become gullible to this type of a situation. Many of these tricks were exposed by the mentalist and magician Darren Brown as well in his documentary Miracles for Sale. He would show how sometimes faith healers would find someone who wasn't completely cripple, and yet they were sitting, you know, they might have crutches, and they come up and say, oh, here's a wheelchair, it'll be easier for you. They push them up to the front, and then the p pastor would heal over, or pray over them. They'd stand up. Obviously, they could somewhat walk because they had crutches, but all of a sudden, the, the congregation sees them getting out of a wheelchair. It's a miracle. Case after case after case, there's hundreds of different tricks that they use. It's all been exposed. Another situation, faith healing parents. You have um, the Scheibels. They believed in faith healing and that they didn't need to go to the doctor for modern medicine. Instead, they opted for faith healing. Their first child died of pneumonia. Very curable, very treatable, simply needed some antibiotics. Instead, they opted for faith healing. The judge gave them a warning for, for uh, neglect, child, or, uh, child abuse and neglect. The parents, instead of taking it seriously, when their second kid got sick of pneumonia, again, they turned to prayer and anointing with oil, faith healing methods, and their second child died. It's tragic, it's sad, 
but it happens. And it's verses like these that are dangerous that lead to this kind of a situation. So the assets that are at risk with believing in this stuff, obviously your money. You can fall prey to charlatans who are conning you out of your money. Your health, if you throw away your medication and, and turn to this stuff rather than actually seeking uh, proven, medically proven um, doctors and uh, med medicine. Your reputation, if you fall for this, you can obviously be you know, hugely embarrassed for falling for this, and that's why a lot of people don't come forward when they, hear, you know, when they have a situation like this that they've fallen prey to. And in the worst situations, your very life. So the impacts here, bankruptcy, sickness, humiliation, and death. Let's take one other example. You have, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna skip through, because you, know, you have uh, people believing in divine protection. They take verses saying, you know, you'll be able to pick up serpents, and you'll be able to drink deadly poison and it won't harm you. Too bad for them, this verse isn't even in the original manuscripts that we have of Mark, and it was likely added later. And yet it's still in the Bible, it still represents a danger. Because people take it, they read it, they take it literally, and they die. This isn't a new thing. Here's one pastor that it happened to him and it happened to his father. And this is an article from 1974 where another snake handler had died after his dad had died of, of being bit by a snake as well. One more situation, the Orthodox Church during the, the height of COVID before the vaccine believed that you couldn't get COVID from um, communion, so they would all share the same spoon and pass it around. Even in the midst of this, as the scandal was going on, you had an ent you know, entire churches, as one that I've covered on my channel in depth with over you know, a thousand different members, hit it, swept it under the rug, said you can't get sick from communion, you can't get sick in church, and even their own members, even their own pastors were passing away from COVID. I believe, am I at time? Now I, I have example after example after example. Unfortunately, I've ran out of time, so I have to leave it there. The fact of the matter is, when you identify the hazards and you link it back to the Bible, there's a clear and obvious direct line between danger and harm. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Holy Kool-Aid, for your opening statement. And we are now going to pass it off to Inspiring Philosophy for their up to 15 minute opening statement. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I'd like to thank Modern Day Debate. I'd like to thank Thomas for agreeing to the debate. Thank you for the opening statement. Uh, there's a lot there I'd like to respond to. Uh, uh, but before we get to that, I would just want to say I really appreciate everyone coming out here. I hope we can have a good back and forth today. Uh, so let me just start by reminding people what the topic is today. The topic is not, are Christians dangerous? Anyone can point to examples of Christians doing bad things or dumb things. But that doesn't mean Christianity is necessarily the cause of negative behavior. The Bible says all humans are sinful, depraved, and this is the reason we need Christianity. Okay? The topic is, is Christianity dangerous? In mere correlations and anecdotal evidence, it's hardly evidence that Christianity is the cause of bad or stupid behavior. Okay? I can find numerous examples, like the League of Militant Atheists, or atheists in general doing bad things. But it'd be absurd for me to argue like Dinesh D'Souza that this means atheism is the cause. This is actually called an attribution error. Okay? In psychology, uh, this is when you unjustifiably attribute an effect to someone because of the beliefs or personality traits they have. But do not do the same when someone in your group does something bad. This would be like saying, look, I saw a priest do something bad. It must be because of his religion. But if a secular humanist did the same thing, well, you know, there's circumstantial stuff that you can't blame secular humanism because secular humanism doesn't advocate for such behavior. Okay? Basically, it's when you claim your actions the actions of, of the members of your own group are situational, but the actions of members of other groups are related to their beliefs. Okay? To show Christianity is dangerous or causes harm, you have to uh, need to find a place in the Bible where you think there's a negative quality taught, then show this verse actually means how you interpret it. Most Christians agree this is how to properly interpret that, and then show evidence this belief results in horrible effects in society and individuals. For example, some atheists will say that Matthew 10, 34, where Jesus says, I came to bring not peace, but a thorn, means Jesus is promoting violence. They need to show that is the proper interpretation. Most Christians agree with this interpretation. And the empirical evidence that shows violence is related to Christians acting out from this command. Problem is, these are all leaps in logic, and you need more than just, just non sequiturs. You need actual evidence of connections. Generally, what many atheists like Phil Zuckerman or Gregory Paul do is they look at ecological correlations, but not at individual correlations. And this can result in an ecological fallacy, which a David A. Freeman says, this is where you, you think relationships observed for groups necessarily hold for individuals. If countries with more fat in the diet have higher rates of breast cancer, then women who eat more fatty foods must be more likely to get breast cancer. These differences may be correct, but are only weakly supported by the aggregate da data. 
it is all too easy to draw incorrect conclusions from aggregate data. Let me give two examples. This study found there was more tolerance for Muslims in secular countries. But when individuals were looked at within these countries, researchers were surprised to find, and I quote, the strongest anti-Muslim attitudes are nonetheless found among the non-religious in these countries. The ecological and the individual correlation did not line up. Additionally, Christians tend to be in more conservative areas, which have less environmentally friendly regulations and laws. However, when individuals were looked at, uh, researchers concluded, we can assert there is no evidence that any of our measures of religiosity intensify the negative political conservatism effect. We provide evidence that the strongest negative conservative effects are found among those who are the least religious. So when you look at individuals, we can see that there is pro-environmental attitudes associated with religion, despite what the eco ecological correlation shows. Now, if Christianity is dangerous, a good way to show that would be to look at war and violence. Uh, so does Christianity lead to war and conflict? Well, there was one study that looked at interstate armed conflict initiation, and if it's associated with Islam, Christianity, and Buddhism. The conclusion was, interstate armed conflict initiation is found to be negatively associated with Christianity, mildly positively associated with Islam, and not associated with Buddhism. So if anyone's debating Muslims, come see me. So, as you can see, Christianity was negatively related to interstate conflict. Another study found religiosity was negatively associated with a willingness to fight in territorial disputes. Another study, or moving on, the, if you go through the Encyclopedia of Wars, you can see very few wars have uh, religion as the primary motivator. And when you just sub subtract Islam, you can see the percentage is cut in half. Now, we can also say there, were, now we can also say there was an exorbitant amount of data that shows Christian religiosity is inversely related to crime and violence. This is a 2001 meta-analysis it found crime was inversely related to religion. Now, also to note, a meta-analysis is not just one study. It takes data from multiple studies, combines them into the meta-analysis to try to find a general trend across multiple studies. Similarly, a 2010 systematic review looked at 270 studies and found that in 90%, crime is inversely related to religion. Only 2%, only two studies, excuse me, found religion was positively associated with crime. That's important, I'll come back to that later. A 2014 study looked at over 180 young adults and adolescents and found that religiosity was inversely related to crime, like drug selling and theft. A 2014 meta-analysis looked at over 190,000 young adults and adolescents, over 62 studies, and found that religiosity, religiosity was inversely related to crime, things like theft, robbery, assault, and murder. Additionally, religiosity uh, seems to correspond with lower levels of direct aggression and indirect, or direct and indirect ag aggression. Intrinsic religiosity facilitates an increase in self-control. Greater religiosity was associated with higher levels of compassion and self-control. But this is just religiosity in general, right? Anything about Christianity here? Well, when you study the sample sizes in these studies, you'll find they predominantly draw from Christian sample sizes in Western nations. As one study put it, a large portion of the existing research has largely focused on Western nations. And a study that wanted to do specifically on Buddhists had to note they, on Buddhists, they said, as a mainstream religion in Western society, Christianity is typically the religion that is the focus for this type of research. Now, how do we know the benefits of Christianity come from the religious beliefs and not just external factors associated with religion, like social structures and forming communities? When I debated Matt Dillahunty, this was his argument. Well, luckily, a large portion of the research divides subjects between, up between two orientations, which can shed some light on this subject. The first is extrinsic religiosity. Now, extrinsic religiosity is uh, these individuals are religious as a means to an end. They're not motivated by religion. One is religious because, not because they believe the core tenets of the faith, but because they want to be part of a community, gain social status, or because it's a family tradition. The extrinsic type turns to God, or turns to God, but without turning away from the self. Some qualify as intrinsically religious. These individuals find, their, find that their religion is their primary motivator. If one is intrinsically religious, they are religious because they want to hold to the core tenets of a faith. Having embraced the creed, the individual endeavors to internalize and follow it fully. So, if the anti-theist is correct, and the benefits Christianity provide come from creating social structures, communities, or extrinsic factors associated with religion, then more benefits should be associated with the E scale. But if intrinsic religiosity is associated with more benefits, then the benefits of Christian religiosity uh, should come from the, or, if they're more associated with intrinsic, then the benefits more likely come from the tenets and beliefs of the worldview. 
So in a nutshell, to know if Christianity is dangerous, it's better to look at the effects of intrinsic religiosity. But when we look at the data, there's more benefits associated with the I scale, intrinsic. So a meta-analysis found intrinsic religiosity tends to correlate with desirable variables like mental health, altruism, and religious commitment. One looked at 34 studies and found aspects of intrinsic religiosity were associated with better mental health. Meta-analysis found religiosity correlates with agreeableness, extroversion, conscientiousness. And uh, when you looked at people, those were identified as mature in religion, they identified with, they uh, aligned with four of the big five personality traits and negatively correlated with neuroticism. Another meta-analysis found there was positive benefits from intrinsic religiosity and on extrinsic or ritualistic aspects of Christianity. Now, similarly, uh, moving on, a review found that uh, religious motivators uh, is associated, intrinsic, is associated with higher self-control and self-regulation. And the researchers noted they predominantly drew from Christian backgrounds. Another found intrinsic religiosity was negatively associated with depression. When it comes to suicide, uh, the study author says it appears that commitments to the beliefs and rituals of Christianity is more of a protective factor for suicidal behavior than the indirect benefits, such as the social relationships that might develop from regular church attendance. Additionally, a uh, meta-analysis did something, this is a little bit different. It drew on Christian sample size to look and noted that Christian priming, religious priming, was associated with pro-social behavior. This is when individuals are primed with religious study, prayer, and then study next to a control group. It was found that priming with religious motivators uh, resulted in more pro-social behavior. So, uh, moving past this, uh, to religiosity in general, one surveyed 850 studies and found religious involvement is generally associated with greater well-being, less depression, anxiety, greater social support, and less substance abuse. Another found uh, that 50, looking at 15 studies noted that religiosity was associated with better uh, grade point average and test scores in black and Hispanic American youth. Now, this is only scratching the surface of the research I could draw up. Now, of course, uh, there was some research that doesn't, doesn't show positive benefits, as I noted earlier. And it's very easy to find studies or anecdotal examples that show Christian religiosity is associated with negative outcomes. For example, this systematic review looked at 444 studies on depression and religiosity and found that most show religion and spirituality are negatively correlated with depression. But 6% reported greater depression, which is about 26 studies. So couldn't someone just write an article saying that over 25 studies, uh, and I modified a Salon article for this, have showed that religion is associated with higher levels of depression. Now, it would sound impressive, but it would be cherry-picked data. We need to look at systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and a collection of the data to find the overall trend, which shows Christian religiosity is positively associated with numerous benefits. And there is no strong evidence to show it's dangerous or leads to horrible consequences uh, when we take into account the available data. I uh, also want to talk about something else here. Uh, does Christianity lead to LGBT prejudice? The intuitive answer is things to think yes, but in four slides I'm going to try to show you otherwise. So a meta-analysis did find intrinsic religiosity was positively correlated with negative attitudes of homosexuality. But they also noted much of the homosexual uh, uh, prejudice uh, of fundamentalists is in excess of what is required by the religious ideology. Therefore, non-doctrinal factors associated with religiosity might also contribute to prejudice. This was also sort of backed up in a later cross-cultural analysis. The meta-analysis I just showed you only focused on U.S. This one looked in 79 different countries. They found that people who are more intrinsically motivated tend to be less homonegative. Intrinsic religi religios religious motivated people have higher tolerance. They also noted there's a lot of cultural artifacts. So the longer homosexual activity has been compliant with the law, the lower homonegativity of the citizen. More homonegativity was found among those who were older, had lower income, less education, these things. So researchers noted there's some sort of cultural factor going on here, which other research has sort of indicated. So other studies have found that much of the LGBTQ prejudice might be mediated by right-wing authoritarianism and, to and traditionalism, uh, which a really good study actually uh, looked at this more in depth. Uh, and they factored out the different mediating effects uh, in a sample size out of um, various different uh, people of different backgrounds in Brazil. They said the factor traditionalism fully mediated the path connecting religiosity and prejudice towards sexual and gender diversity, that it only reduced the magnitude of the association uh, from 0 0.30 to a negative 0.23. So it actually reversed it. It showed that when you factor out traditionalism and right-wing authoritarianism, religiosity is negatively correlated with prejudice. 
It is not religiosity itself or the degree of religious practice that motivates prejudice, but rather the degree of adherence to traditional values. Now, but doesn't Christianity lead to right-wing nationalism or right-wing authoritarianism? Well, no, there's actually some research that shows the opposite. So this study found that the strongest anti-immigration policies are found among non-active Christians. So the more you become secular, the more you move away from Christianity, the more you move into anti-immigration policies. Specifically, this study found we have no, found no evidence that Christian nationalism mobilized church-based support in the election. Uh, this is demonstrated by the fact that, our that in our results, Christian nationalism is only strongly associated with Trump support for voters who do not attend religious service. So ironically, if you want to get rid of these kind of things, you should be encouraging people to be more religious if they're on the right, for example, according to these studies, because that'll de decrease some of these things. So I want to conclude by this. Overall, we can say Christianity is not dangerous. It is a net gain for society. Christianity can be comparable to hospitals. It's the, the dangers of Christianity going on out there. I can see that. <laughs> the overwhelming evidence shows hospitals are a positive benefit. Uh, however, sometimes people have botched surgeries or have negative outcomes at hospitals. But we would not conclude hospitals are dangerous from isolated cases, small percentage, and anecdotal evidence. We can find those examples all day. We have to look at the overall data, meta-analyses, systematic reviews, and a collection of the data to find the overall effects of intrinsic religiosity from Christianity. The overwhelming evidence shows that Christianity has positive benefits and the negative effects on individuals and societies is relatively low to zero. There is very little to, little to no evidence you can show that Christianity leads to dangerous effects because the studies show it leads to so many positive effects. If it's showing so many positive effects, there's no reason to conclude it, it creates any sort of danger. And as you, I noted, sometimes the dangerous aspects associated with religious individuals can come from other aspects. Traditionalism, uh, low education, right-wing authoritarianism, left-wing authoritarianism, you name it. Just because you see a religious person doing a bad thing, that doesn't mean the Christian religiosity caused that. And that's why we rely on researchers to help us find these conclusions. Thank, and with that, I will conclude my time. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Inspiring Philosophy, for your opening statement. And with that, we are going to hand it back over to Holy Kool-Aid for their up to eight minute rebuttal. Fantastic, thank you. I want to look at a, a number of different things that you said. First of all, it, it still seems to me like we're having two different debates. I want to focus specifically in on Christianity, and I feel like Inspiring Philosophy still is talking about intrinsic and extrinsic religiosity. We need to make a distinction there. Um, when he says things like, with the, the study on 79 different countries, I actually have it right here. I've read through this study. And when he's, he says that when you look at, you shift it from looking at purely intrinsic religiosity to, or from extrinsic religiosity to intrinsic religiosity, you see less of a connection. But there's still a, a connection. And all throughout this paper, one of the strongest points that they made was that there was a very strong connection in, uh, across the board with these countries when it came to the link between religiosity and homonegativity. And it was even stronger among Muslim and Christian countries, and it was the weakest among Buddhist and atheist countries. So to just completely write it off simply because there's you know, less of an effect with intrinsic religiosity, I, I don't think that that's fair. And of course there's gonna be other factors that come into play with this type of thing. That, you know, you're, you're not looking just for one linear connection with this type of thing. Of course, correlation doesn't equal causation. That's kind of the golden rule of statistics. But you can oftentimes have a non-linear connection. What do I mean by that? It means that you can have uh, religiosity leading to homonegativity in addition to other factors leading to homonegativity as well. And that's what they found in this study. That's why you perform a multivariant analysis. They're not just looking at one factor, they're factoring it all in, breaking it down, trying to separate them out, and they found a very, very strong link between homonegativity or uh, bias and prejudice towards uh, the LGBT and religiosity, especially strongly among Christianity. And that's far from the only study that, that says that. If I had time before in my last one, there was a slide I was gonna get to that talked about another study that found a strong link between um, homonegativity and, uh, and Christianity. And here's the problem with that, is you can say, okay, you know, so maybe there is some type of a link, but you know, it's, it's not, like how does this lead to harm? Well, one study from, um, the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology found that shunning 
can lead to increased tribalism and hostility towards the outgroup. Another study found that ostracism leads to, top de uh, um, leads to an increase in depression. So when you have these things that people are, you're, you're, you're not just simply pulling out of the blue saying, you know, hey, I think that there might be some correlation between these things. You go and you ask people, what is your motivation for doing this? Why are you acting this way towards members of the LGBT community? What is your reason for anti-trans bigotry or for um, persecuting gay people or shunning them or kicking them out of the house? pushing them towards suicide and you know pushing them towards higher rates of depression what's the reasoning behind this and you get bible verses like second corinthians 6 14 do not be yoked um no sorry not that one there's um a man shall not lie with another man as one does with a woman if you do so you shall be stoned you know, you, you look at verses like this, you look at verses in Romans, you look all throughout the Bible, and there's verses that can be interpreted that way very easily, and they are. This isn't my interpretation. I'm not saying this is the way it should or shouldn't be interpreted. I'm saying this is the way that Christians are in mass, oftentimes by the hundreds of millions, majority position interpreting these verses, and it is their direct statement for why they are acting in a particular way. So you can say correlation doesn't equal causation, but you go and you say, okay, what is the motive? If this was a jury and we had someone on trial and we asked them, why did you kill this person? And they say, well, I saw him, you know, sleeping with my wife. You wouldn't say, well, maybe you're mistaken. Correlation doesn't equal causation. You know, that, that could have been the cause. It could have been the motive. No, you trust them. You take them at their word. And that's what each one of these studies is doing. The studies that he looked at dividing religion into intrinsic versus extrinsic, they're using a, a scale that was developed by Gordon, um, is it Gordon uh, Alport? Alport. Alport in, um, to, to look at you know, intrinsic versus extrinsic religiosity. That's, it's called the ROS scale. And the ROS scale is entirely self-dictated. Um, self so it's, it's a poll. It's a survey. You ask someone, how religious are you? Do you do this? Do you engage in this? Do you believe this? And it's self-reported. You trust them, you take them at, your, at their word. So if you're gonna say correlation doesn't equal causation, but then you have people directly saying this belief in this verse, this reason is the reason why I'm going out and doing these things and engaging in these behaviors that are harmful, and we see a direct link between the action and the harm, and then you go and you say, well, you know, that's correlation causation, we can't really take them at their word for that, but then over here you have people self-reporting why, you know, their level of religiosity and their beliefs and, and how it's making them feel better and, and making them um, better off mentally, you're going to take them at their word for that? Like, that's, that's a double standard, it doesn't work that way. The other problem that we have to look at is a problem with meta-analyses as a whole. Now, I've, I've been involved in social science for a while, one of my degrees is, is in social sciences, specifically uh, political science, and um, I'm not going to write off meta-analyses. I'd be a, a fool to do that. There is a lot of strength in that, and I'll, I'll acknowledge that you know, Michael has done his, his due diligence in gathering these studies. Meta-analyses have a tremendous amount of power, and they shouldn't be ignored. And yet, at the same time, there's, there's a couple of things that you have to be cautious of. For example, here's a meta-analysis called If You Love Me, keep, You'll Keep My Commandments, a meta-analysis on the effects of religion and crime by um, Colin J. Byer. And he found that there was, after you know, performing a massive meta-analysis on uh, 60 different studies that looked at the connection between crime and religion, he found that overall there was you know, a negative association. So as you became more religious, you tended to, to commit less crime, right? And yet at the same time, within this study, there are studies that a part of this meta-analysis that specifically account for why that may be the case. Now, uh, one study was released by Lee Ellis called Religiosity and Criminality from the Perspective of Arousal Theory. The theory that he put forth was that people who typically are under aroused, so let's say I'm under stimulated and I'm bored by a church service, I'm bored sitting around, I want to go out and do something that causes an adrenaline rush, maybe I'm you know, ADHD, you name it, I may be more inclined to um, not be a part of a religion and I also might be uh, more inclined to commit violent acts. So there you have an external factor that's leading to an increase in crime and the religion is not necessarily relevant. As soon as he factored in arousal theory, the connection between decreased violence and uh, religiosity went away. This isn't a one-off study. 
it was replicated. John Cochran released a study on this as well, where, where he looked at the report that Ellis uh, put out and tried to replicate the results. Got exactly the same result. Now, when you take a meta-analysis, you can say, oh, you could cherry pick these studies. The problem is the meta-analysis doesn't take these factors into effect or in, into account. All it does is it looks at the overall number and it says, okay, so there's you know 55 studies that came to this conclusion, five that came to whatever. But if all 55 of the other ones we're using the same methods or the same you know, uh, reporting methods and, and not looking at this one thing or taking it into account, of course you're gonna have skewed data. So I would, I would caution you when it comes to looking at meta-analyses to be a little bit more careful with that. Um, I believe with that I'm at time, but there's more that I'll get to in our back and forth. Thank you so very much, Holy Kool-Aid, for your eight-minute rebuttal. And with that, we're going to hand it right back over to Inspiring Philosophy for your eight-minute rebuttal. Okay, one second. All right, well, thank you for that, Thomas. I appreciate the uh, feedback. Let's uh, try to go through these points as quickly as I can. Uh, this is why I noted that uh, you talked about, I'm talking about more in the E&I scale. This is why I noted that I'm predominantly, the researchers predominantly draw from Christian nations. Those are the primary parts of the subject. You brought up uh, meta-analyses and you noted that, uh, that there are limitations. I absolutely agree. That's why I drew on multiple studies. And I also went over the aspects of intrinsic religiosity and how it leads to more self-control, self-regulation, altruism, and pro-social behavior. Of course, there are other factors that reduce crime that can factor in those studies. But when we look at specifically the effects of religious motivators, they do contribute to effects that would reduce crime. Uh, you talked about the uh, EI skill being uh, kind of subjective. That's, I feel like that's simplifying it. The, there, no one comes into a room and goes, are you intrinsic or extrinsic? They take certain tests, they ask them certain questions, and these professionals come to the conclusion that they're going to pry and try to get answers from them. They're not going to readily admit right away. They're going to try to get more details from them before they actually, so they don't actually tell them what their beliefs are. There's a lot, sure, that's not a perfect science, but this is why we do it in multiple studies, and multiple studies are finding the overall same conclusion when we keep factoring that in. Now, you talked about the homonegativity aspect in that one study. We need to be clear about what homonegativity is. It, can, it doesn't necessarily mean prejudice. In the very paper you cited, it said self-reported homonegativity does not necessarily correspond to the implicitly existing aversion to homosexuality. It can mean an intellectual disapproval. It's defined differently from various studies. We have to keep that in mind. So, this is why I also brought up the other studies that talk about how when you factor out other things like traditionalism and right-wing authoritarianism, uh, religiosity does not really account for the prejudice there. That's something we need to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, so what else did I want to get to here? So um, I think I got to a lot of it there. I do want to talk about how you're overall talking about how religiosity, uh, Christian religiosity, people can interpret verses and then uh, do all sorts of horrible things from with that. Well, I mean, you could do that with just about anything. I, I could interpret the Pillsbury Doughboard into telling me that I'm going out to should go out and kill people. That doesn't mean that the, the company is responsible if a crazy person does that and goes out and kills people. Uh, someone could interpret uh, the tenets of um, Marxism to say it's time to go up and start shooting capitalists, like right now. Uh, that would not necessarily mean that m Marxism is necessarily the cause, it would, if unless they're directly promoting it and that we understood Marx directly as interpret it as that's what he's in saying in his interpretation, then we could say such a thing. We need to do more than just say, oh, someone used this as their excuse. So a lot of times, as I've noted in a lot of these studies, people can cite that kind of thing, but their motivators are more, they're sort of using this as like the means to an end. Uh, for example, in the whole uh, Christians, right-wingers, moving away from Christianity into more secular ideas, there was a researcher named Roger Brubaker, and he, write, and he writes this, when Christians in Western Europe start becoming more secular, you know, especially the right-wing side, uh, secularism is redefined as an ideology of a right, of the right. And the right is also appropriating liberal themes like gender equality and tolerance for homosexuality. The most secularized regions in the world being characterized in uh, regional civilizational terms. Christianity is redefined as a matrix of liberalism, secularity, gender equality, and gay rights. He said this in a new Christian, Christianist secularism in Europe in 2016. What he's basically pointing out is that a lot of times when people get more secular, uh, they often take Christian themes uh, and they reinterpret them in all sorts of secular ways to sort of fit what they're doing. That doesn't mean Christianity is necessarily the cause, because they're taking themes and they're reinterpreting it. Recently, the atheist historian uh, Nathan Johnstone, in his book, The New, A the New Atheist 
a myth in history, noted that this is what a lot of the Nazis did. Is they took a lot of Christian themes, reinterpreted them in their Nazi ideology to help convince public to try to bring them along. They were using Christian terms and whatnot. So just because you bring up somebody may have taken a verse or whatnot and said, well, this is the reason. That doesn't necessarily mean Christianity is the cause. This is why it's better to rely on studies, not necessarily on anecdotal cases like this. Uh, so when it comes to a lot of that stuff, we need to start focusing on what the data shows. Sure, you can always find anecdotal cases, but that doesn't tell us what they mean by Christianity. That doesn't tell us if they're actually drawing from the full understanding of Christian doctrine. We need to be careful with that because Nathan Johnstone, for example, in his book, notes that there were many atheists who looked at what atheism was, what secularism was, and they thought it was this idea they need to wipe out religion by all means necessary. The League of Militant Atheists he talks about in this book, in this USSR. Now, he explicitly says atheism does not necessarily cause this bad behavior. It was these wackos reinterpreting ideas they had gotten and using it to sort of eradicate religion. He says it's a fact people have died in the name of atheism. To quote directly from him in his book, he says, we must accept that there was a significant atheist component to the crime and forced collectivization and that it provides insight into the potential forms and meanings of atheist violence. It says on page 206. On page 181, he says, uh, the oppression of believers by atheists and in the name of atheism itself is simply an historical fact. Now, I don't think, a I agree with him that atheism is not necessarily the cause. But just because they interpreted an atheistic worldview uh, that doesn't, and used it as part of their ideology, doesn't necessarily mean it's the cause. Likewise, uh, people can draw Christianity into a larger worldview and say it's what's motivating them, motivating them to do certain things. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the cause. Johnston doesn't make that claim, and neither should we. We should look at what the data indicates when they were studied by professionals or experts in the field of psychology and social science. Uh, and with that, I'll conclude, and we can move on. Thank you very much for your rebuttals. And with that, we are going to move into about 24, 25 minutes of open discussion. Once again, gentlemen, the floor is on yours. Who would you like to start? Uh, you go ahead. OK. Um, I want to ask you real quick about um, your Pillsbury Doughboy example, you said that if you have, you know, hallucinations about, you know, the Pillsbury Doughboy or something, or I forget your exact wording, but it was like, if you thought that he was telling you to go out and commit harm, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Pillsbury Doughboy is dangerous. Was mm -hmm. that sort of well, a... Well, I wouldn't say the company caused it. Yeah, that the, the company caused it. But that's not really what we're asking. We're not asking, does Christianity... Like, is, is this the, the correct interpretation of Christianity? Does correct, interpretation, does correct Christianity cause the, this result? What we're asking is, is it dangerous? If you had the Pillsbury Doughboy releasing, you know, don't, or, uh, confectionery goods, what have you, and you have hundreds of millions of people all seeing the Pillsbury Doughboy and having these hallucinations, pretty soon you'd start to ask some questions and be like, hey, what's going on? Like, at that point, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know what the link is, but would you at least start to admit that maybe there's a danger there? That I wouldn't say it's a red flag something could be up. But I mean, like, if we're going to go into hypotheticals, maybe it's, you know, maybe the conspiracy theorists are right and the CIA is using 5G towers to manipulate people and they're just, they put some sort of secret waves under the commercial or whatnot. I, again, I wouldn't blame the company. I'd say it's a red flag. I'd say we got to investigate this more. You see, if, if someone told me that atheism leads to, you know, tremendous atrocities and horrific things and murder and stuff, and I actually was able to find, you know, example after example where the overwhelming majority of cases of atheists are actually interpreting something, that they have some sort of core doctrine that they're interpreting in a negative and harmful way, and I can demonstrate that, I would 100% agree with you that it's dangerous. And I would say, what can we do to safeguard and protect against it? What can we do to prevent this from happening? And that's what, that's what I'm trying to say with Christianity, is I'm not saying that every Christian is dangerous or that it necessarily 100% of the time leads to these outcomes by any stretch. Because like, there's lots of great Christians, there's lots of tolerant Christians, there's lots of loving Christians out there. The, the point of this is, is I'm saying, can we at least recognize that there are dangers that we have to be careful of? Well, I mean, that's with anything. That's why I gave, talked about hospitals. So you're not that Christianity is dangerous. I'm not saying Christianity is dangerous. I'm saying there's dangers that are just, if that's, the, if that's the low bar, hospitals are dangerous. Because you would have to conclude that, oh, hospitals are dangerous because bot surgeries could happen. 
if that's if that's what you're trying to get at there, that that creates all sorts of philosophical issues and understandings of how we're going to structure a society. And I wouldn't even say that Christianity is necessarily the cause, because when you look at the overall data, we're seeing positive benefits. We're not seeing the idea that multiple people are sort of getting this idea and running wild with it. There could be issues with mental states of some of these people. I think it's with some of those faith healers, for example. Uh, I, I would say there could be parts of their psychology that are causing them to factor that in and cause them to do bad things. How would you determine that? How would you, how would you determine if there's a causal link between their religion and like, what, what, would, what would it take for you to be convinced? Well, I, I get, put up that, that slide earlier. I said, so again, if you go to back my example of Matthew 10, 34, I've come to not bring peace, but a sword. First thing you have to do is make sure we're interpreting that correctly in the context. You gotta agree that most Christians agree this is how to interpret it. And even from that, then you have to also show that there is some sort of evidence that, peop that Christians have that command and now they think from that command they got to go out and do violence, and you can show using um, some sort of study that it actually is causing Christians to commit violence. So again, the three steps you got to show. Proper interpretation, there is, yes, Christians do agree this is how to properly interpret it, and then there is evidence in social sciences is causing but, benefits. But how, how do you get two point, almost 2.3 or whatever it is, billion Christians to all agree on one thing? They can't agree on what a pulpit should be made well, out of. Well, sure we do. We all, less, uh, like, Christians, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, all agree on core doctrines. Trinity, uh, virgin birth, resurrection, inspiration of scripture, uh, second coming. I mean, we all agree on those. We agree on a lot of things. We agree that um, the uh, first book of the New Testament is Matthew. We agree Paul wrote, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians, Romans, 2 Corinthians. We agree on all that stuff. So you can get Christians to agree on a lot That's of stuff. That's not a very long list. Well, I can keep going if you'd like. I mean, <laughs> we all agree that there is a God. We all agree that the, there the, the problem here is that interpretations are subjective. Right, so my interpretation of a Bible verse and you know a, a Christian's interpretation of a Bible verse and your interpretation are going to be wildly different, not not necessarily, but it is the case in a alarming number of situations. And so if if you say okay, we have to get to the original doctrine, how do we even go about doing that? Like you could say okay, we go back to the original Greek, we go back to the original Hebrew. How many people on planet Earth right now speak ancient Hebrew or speak Koine Greek? Look, interpretation like, stuff. Yeah, I know you speak Greek. You stay out of this. Uh, <laughs> uh, interpretation stuff, I understand, is always going to be an issue. This is why I say there's three steps in here. Are most Christians agree, believe that Jesus is telling them to commit violence? No. And we don't see that in the studies as well. Now, I know that's an extreme example, and I want to be sure everyone knows I'm not accusing you of making that argument. But again, I understand interpretation can do that. But when it comes to things like how to live your life, most Christians are going to draw from places like the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the Lord's Prayer, uh, John 3.16, Paul talking about how uh, the law summed up in the love thy neighbor kind of thing. Well, yeah, but, but you, can have, you can have all of those things. And, you know, and I, and I can go through and agree with you on certain you know, core tenets of the Bible and say, yeah, this one's great. This one is you know, beneficial to society. And we're not going to disagree there. But like I, I said with the nuclear power example, like you can have benefits and still have dangers that you have to be cognizant of. And I would think that if you have a, a, a text that's so rife for misinterpretation, where you have hundreds of millions of people in, in some cases believing in things and then attributing it to, their, to, to the, the scripture that they follow, then it's like, okay, at the very least you have a book that is, can very dangerously and easily be misinterpreted. Well, I mean, it get, that is setting such a low bar that you have to conclude, uh, well, you know, we get, you get, kitchen knives are therefore dangerous. Hospitals are therefore dangerous. Vaccines are dangerous because like 0.001% get an autoimmune reaction kind of thing. Uh, this is setting such an incredibly low bar that it just everything it reduces to absurdity in a lot of ways. If that's our metal to say, yes, it's dangerous. Well, then, yeah, we all have to agree, but we also have to agree atheism is dangerous. I mean, I could cite uh, this one study that I was going to bring up in a past debate, uh, but I didn't get time to, where it talked about that in when people have a, they looked at uh, various religious views, Christianity, Islam, uh, animism, all these different types of views. And what they found was, it was the study was in 2016, Moralistic Gods, Supernatural, Supernatural Punishment and the Expansion of Human Society. And they said people from diverse religious communities in eight different countries around the world, researchers found that those who believe in moralistic, punitive, and all-knowing gods were more likely to be impartial and engage in pro-social behavior. Now, just from that alone, I could say, well, I, then I guess we can show it's dangerous that if you reject this kind of God, it, you know, you're going to reject these kind of behaviors and you could lead to bad behavior. By that logic, you'd have to conclude that atheism or the rejection of this, of this all-knowing, powerful God is dangerous because it could potentially lead to something bad. 
But again, this, set, this reduces everything to absurdity at this point. Well, the, the problem, that, again, that, that we're having here is that you have Christians who are, are specifically attributing their actions to the core tenets that they're, that they're following. And so you know, they're saying, this is the reason why I'm doing it. It's, it's because of this verse. And so it's like, if, if they have this belief system, they're tying it to a verse, it's happening you know, in the, the hundreds of millions, you're seeing a strong connection and you know, multivariant analyses, you're seeing that there's connections between these harmful actions and these belief systems. And then, maybe this will help, you, know, you have a peer-reviewed meta-analysis saying that beliefs inform actions. Not only do beliefs inform actions, but you're more likely to act on a particular belief when it's firmly held, when it's regularly reinforced, when it's a core part of your identity, when it's everything that, that, that fits it like, that the church fits this description like a hand in a glove. When you're, you know, you're going to church every single Sunday, you're reinforcing these beliefs, they're strong beliefs, you are going to act on those beliefs. Now that in and of itself is just human psychology. That's not necessarily bad. We all act on our beliefs. But what this is doing is it's categorically tying belief to action. So if, if you say, okay, here's a book you know, that, that people are reading and they're interpreting in mass, sometimes majority consensus, because this is, it is subjective to some extent. And you know, it's 100% subjective in how you, you know, read and interpret. And so you're reading a book, majority opinion is coming to certain conclusions that are harmful, and then people are acting on it. That right there is a recipe for danger, that is a dangerous recipe. And if, if you wanna be obtuse about it and say, well, anything is dangerous, water is dangerous, it's like how many hundreds of millions more people have to commit atrocities based off of that before you say, hold up, I acknowledge that there's a danger here. There might be some great benefits and that's cool. Like, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to say that there are benefits, but at what point are we gonna say, we have to take the dangers seriously well, then and we have me, to address them? Let me respond with this then. Okay, so if beliefs inform actions all the time, then we can just go to, again, atheist historian Nathan Johnstone, when he talked about how a lot of times the militant, the militant League of Atheists in the USSR used their commitment to an atheist worldview to justify the idea that they could go out and commit these atrocities. And again, the study I cited noted that when you lack a belief in God like that, it tends to move away from sort of good social behaviors we can see. By that logic, any sort of belief in atheism could, of course, result in sort of bad things, and we have to acknowledge there's a danger there. I mean, for example, Nietzsche said, when one gives up on the Christian faith, one pulls the, right, the rights to the Christian morality right from under his feet. But, but, Hold on, but, let me finish here. Tom Holland, of course, builds up on that and says the same thing. Because one of the things, for example, John Stone is noting in his book is that, you're right, beliefs often do inform actions. But atheism itself is not just a belief that there is no God, end of story. It then opens up questions of morality, the John Stone notes, questions of our place in the universe, questions of what we can do. Those beliefs could very well have just said they informed the actions of the Militant League of Atheists and all the bad things they did. But again, I feel like that's oversimplifying it. I feel like we're taking dangerous and interpreting the word dangerous in an extremely vague understanding to the point where we have to say just everything is dangerous. There's no way to run a society or to judge a worldview or anything like that. We got to look at things specifically that come from it and the best way to look at that is what comes out of it through social science and psychology studies. I mean, that was a tremendous exercise in whataboutism. It was, okay, well, you know, okay, if you're going to say that Christianity is dangerous, what about atheism? It can be dangerous too. Okay. If, we, if you want to have another debate called, is atheism dangerous? Are you, <laughs> so you're, you're saying atheism I, can be dangerous? I'm saying that there, there may be some, some things. That's not what's on trial today. There may be some dangers. I'm, I'm happy to have that discussion at another time. That's not what we're here to talk about. What we're here to talk about is, is Christianity dangerous? And when I present a, a very clear cut case of how you have something that's rife for misinterpretation, and I show the link to the dangers that are caused, and you say, well, but in, in that case, anything can be dangerous. What about atheism? I'm like, no, 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 like you're, you're missing the point. I, I showed a clear cut case of how Christianity can lead to harmful, dangerous things. And it's not just happening as a one-off. Like this is happening at scale. And I, like, I just want an acknowledging of that, because as soon as you start saying, well, you know, this other thing can be dangerous and that can be dangerous too, it's like, okay, but at least admit that this is dangerous too. So are hospitals dangerous to you? I mean, it, it, if, if it, they can be, there can be aspects of them that are. See, I feel like we're defining dangerous differently then. And I just simply don't agree that that is a qualification to say that a worldview is dangerous because someone could take it, reinterpret it and use it however they want. And I would also push back on the actual motivators of the person. Are they getting their motivators from the verse? Or are they getting their motivators from the, like, I want to do something bad, let me find a verse to justify it, and I'll run wild with it. 
I, we see people do that all the time with all sorts of different ideologies, all sorts of different things. But that doesn't mean the ideology is causing it. They it have some sort of motivators it. inside of them that are causing them to want to do bad thing, and they're just looking for justification. So, I mean, if we're going to do that, I could say you could say Christianity is can be used as a justification for someone who wants to do bad things. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily the cause. This is why we, I correlated the difference between factoring out the religious motivators and showing what is actually causing the bad behavior. You gotta go a little bit further than that. You gotta actually show that you know, there is an actual link here other than someone grabbed a verse to justify their actions. Okay, let's run with that. Let's say that they, that they did the bad thing first and then they used the religion to justify it afterwards, like a post hoc justification, right? Okay, if, if that's what's going on, you still have a Bible that can easily be used to justify horrible things after the fact. If I were to take, for example, let's say that I were to take a book, you know, a kid's book that says, you know, just love everyone and be good to all the people around you, and that's all that's in the book. It would be very, very, very hard to take the fundamentals of that book and interpret it in a negative way. I'm sure there could be someone who could, you know, do all kinds of mental gymnastics to get there, but you're not going to have people doing it in mass. You're not going to have like people on a large scale interpreting it to come to these incredibly dangerous conclusions. Now, if, if on the other hand, if let's say that you have, you know, churches that are like, maybe the, maybe the pastor is already a bigot ahead of time. Maybe he is already, you know, uh, incredibly racist and he uses, he, he acts in a racist way and then he justifies it afterwards. If his whole congregation takes a look at it and says, oh, well, you know, I guess the Bible, you know, makes it all right because this verse says, you know, and, and he was able to justify it like that. No, that's not a justification for racism. And people are willing to, to look away and, and, and turn their, their eyes when they think that the Bible mandated it and so therefore it's okay. Whether it comes before or after doesn't really make any difference. It's still able to justify horrible things. It, it, do, do you see the, the connection there? I mean, but again, this is just re reducing to absurdity. You can justify your actions with anything you want. You could do like the USSR did. Well, we, there's no God who's going to judge us. There's no uh, overriding moral principle that's going to force us to do things. Therefore, we can go out and kill all these Orthodox priests. And as John Stone notes in his book, a lot of times there was, they were put to the gun to the head and said, hey, will you deconvert? No? Okay, bam. Damn, now, that's hugely that's, dangerous. It is. It's horrible. So, but so what I wouldn't safeguards say can we put atheism in place? is dangerous because of that. Because I feel like what we're doing is we're interpreting dangerous. That form dangerous. of atheism is. That form of, well, here now, here that's, here's a thing now. Now we're separating on different forms. If that's the case, then you have to acknowledge that there are other motivators, other aspects of tradition that are going into all different forms of Christianity. How can you then say, when the studies don't show it, that Christianity is the cause of these things, just because they're using it to justify it? Because they say it's the cause. They say, they say all sorts of things is the cause. Yeah, but if, if I mean, I, I'm not here to, to police how obtuse you're being. Like, if, if, if I think that it's, it's imper inherently obvious to the audience that, like, if someone were to get up on stage and say, you know, I killed someone and this was my motive, you believe them. They're self-reporting their motive. They're saying, I read this verse and it said to do this and I did it. So then let me go back to the Pillsbury Doughboy example. Someone says the same thing. Would we therefore say Pillsbury Doughboy is dangerous? I mean, show me a case where, where people are interpreting the Pillsbury Doughboy to mean that and where they're doing it in mass and gathering in huge congregations and all coming to the same conclusion. Well, we would say their mental health is what is dangerous. They're using something to justify. We need to clar clarify here between mental health and the person's own motivators versus what they use to justify it. But motivators see, are what are actually causing the actions there. I'm not willing to say that religion is a mental illness. And I feel like you're teetering on the edge there of saying, okay, here's people who in mass, you know, hundreds of millions are coming to this conclusion. Well, it's just their mental health. Well, how do you know it's, it's hundreds of millions? It's just their mental health. They're just mentally ill. It's like, no, I don't, I, I have more respect for Christians than that. Well, uh, first of all, I'm not saying you're making that argument. And you're, you keep saying hundreds of millions. I mean, is there any research that shows hundreds of millions are taking verses from the Bible to use them to do horrible things? Well, I mean, you can extrapolate statistics pretty easily. So you can look at, at for example, uh, you know, the, the stat that I gave, where it was 82% of, of people in America um, believe in faith healing, right? Yeah. Okay. So of that, you would you know, most likely come to the conclusion that it's, it's even higher among Christians than among non-believers. Is that a, a, fair, a fair leap to say, you know? Okay, so if, if you say of that 82%, that, you know, there's, what, around 200 million believers in America? I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head. So, if, you know, what's 85% of 200 million? And, and are you going to say, you know, now you have 2 billion Christians and we've only looked at 10% of them? 
you're already looking at numbers that are easily in the hundreds of millions just through that one extrapolation. So, so it's, it's not unreasonable to, to come to these numbers is what I'm saying. So like they're not exact. By your logic, though, if a Christian does a bad thing, that therefore is evidence of Christianity causing the bad behavior or them using the justified. I it's mean, evidence that it's dangerous. By that logic, I mean, the Bible is going to say that because this is everyone's sins. Everyone does something bad. If that's the standard, I mean, what are we, again, everything reduces to absurdity at this point. No, but it's, it's not like, for, for, for example, if, if let's say that I go out and I murder someone in cold blood and someone says, hey, don't you know that, you know, the Ten Commandments, it says don't kill, like, why did you do that? And I said, well, I just didn't like his face. Okay, well, that's obviously not something that I'm pulling from the Bible and the Bible's saying to do something different. But if there's some horrible atrocity that I go out and I do or some, something that I do that puts myself at harm, like let's say that I, I believe in faith healing and I go out and I give all my money away to a faith healer and I throw away my prescription or, or I throw away my grandma's prescription and she dies of cancer, okay? In that situation, I've done something that's harmful. I've done something dangerous. Maybe it wasn't malicious. Maybe I didn't have, you know, I, I wanted the best for my grandma and I just made a mistake because I didn't know better. That's still dangerous. And I'm still, I'm drawing on verse after verse after verse after verse. And it's not a one-off case. Like th these are beliefs that are held at scale. Again, the motivators from what the studies show us do not actually show that the religiosity is the cause. That's why I brought up the no, studies to figure out but that's, religious that's, motivators versus traditionalism and other things. But that's what this study shows is that belief, that in beliefs form. inform actions, but, uh, that you again, act upon your beliefs. But people have multiple beliefs. And this is why some studies will focus out on other aspects of beliefs that are most likely causing the behavior. And, and that's why you have multivariant analyses that will try to look and, and take those out and they'll still find a strong connection because it's a nonlinear connection, but they still find a strong uh, causal connection between. Is that um, the 79 country one? Yes. Again, they actually say in there, again, their homo negativity does not define absolute aversion. And again, the other studies I noted. Necessarily. Actually, necessarily, yeah, they but can. again. But again, that's a leap in logic right there. But so. it's also kind of irrelevant to the, the overall point that's being made, though. What? That, like, you, you can find causal connections between belief and action. They don't say causal connection there. But you can do, you can, can when, when you're looking for causation, causation is really tricky in social sciences. Right. Because, I mean, in any science, it's really hard to say something 100%, right? Mm -hmm. That's not how science works. Science comes up with competing hypotheses, and it tries to eliminate all of the possible ones until you're left with one. And it says, this is the best answer that we have right now, right? That's how it works, and that's the best that we've got. So in, in the case of this, you say, what are all the possible factors that can account for this? And you also look at, okay, with this data line, with this correlation, how strong is the correlation? What's the R squared number? How, how much does it deviate from the mean? And if you have like a really, really, really strong correlation, and then you start factoring in all these other variables, and you're like, you know, even with all of that taken into account, there's still this undeniable connection here. There's probably some linkage. It might still be a third factor. It might be something else. That's why, you know, causation is, is always very tricky to come about. But when you have people themselves giving motive and saying, this is why I do it, and it fits the data, that's a really strong case. And again, that's why I brought up additional studies and showed, talked about their cultural artifacts and whatnot. And again, homonegativity does not mean prejudice. cultural artifacts into account with this. Yeah, and they, again, homonegativity doesn't mean prejudice according to their own stuff. But again, we're defining dangerous in different ways here. You want to say that just because, I mean, by logic, the chairs people sitting in this room are dangerous. The, uh, your shirt is dangerous because someone could take it off and strangle someone with it. I mean, this just reduces everything to absurdity. And what we actually want to do is find out is what ideologies are actually going to be better for society, what are actually going to do, uh, regress society, what ideas are actually going to uh, lead to horrible out outcomes. I mean, if we're just going to say, oh, I found one case where a Christian did something bad and he used a verse to justify it, therefore Christianity is dangerous. Well, I mean, what, what is the standard here? It's at just what scale? At what at what point? Because I feel like as soon as you start doing a cost-benefit analysis, you've already admitted that there's danger, and you've already conceded the debate. Now, if you want to talk about the scale and, and cost-benefit, and maybe it's better, maybe it's worse, okay, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to continue talking about that specifically. But my, my question would be, at that point, where, where do you draw the line in, okay, the numbers are big enough, the death toll is big enough, the number of people who have been ostracized and shunned and hurt and Again, driven to suicide As I went over, it was actual enough. studies that would show that. If, you know, if... Intrinsic religiosity was harmful and dangerous. Well, what do you mean it, by intrinsic religiosity? Intrinsic specific? Christian religiosity, specifically Christians, it would be why, intrinsic why, motivators. So let me, wait, let me wait, wait, before you, because I don't want to get lost in, in terminology. So when you say intrinsic Christianity, 
intrinsic religiosity from Christian backgrounds. Can you give a definition of intrinsic religiosity? Um, I did in the earlier slide here. I can put it back up. So intrinsic religiosity is when persons are disposed to use or persons find their massive motive in religion, ma ma master motive in religion, having embraced the creed of individual endeavors to internalize it and follow it fully. And that subject is a Christian. They'd be an intrinsic religious Christian. So, but is, is love your neighbor intrinsically Christian? Love thy neighbor is a command. And when someone is intrinsically religious, they draw from those kind of commands as their motivators. That's not the point. Where, not necessarily. Well, hold on. That's the point we have to get to. And guys, I do want to thank both Holy Kool Aid and Spy Philosophy. We are actually about to switch into the Q and A. We will let them have closing statements. But I'm going to ask if you guys have any questions in the audience. If you could start to make a line in the center for either or both of our interlocutors. And I am going to just start off while people are getting in line. We do have a question from one of our major sponsors of the event, Dr. Cy Gart, as sent the sponsor question from home. He asks, if Christianity does pose a risk of danger, how would you go about mitigating that risk, nuclear power is highly controlled, what would you suggest to control the risk of Christianity? What do you think about societies that place strict controls on Christianity or other religions? And thank you so much. Who is that directed at? I believe that is directed at you, because it seems okay. that he's asking if Christianity does pose a risk how are you going to mitigate that risk? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I'm a, a firm believer in a free and open society with freedom of religion, freedom of expression. So I, I think that the way to go about doing it would be to educate people of the dangers and of the risk, which is what I do on my channel on Holy Kool-Aid regularly. And when I see that it happens regularly, I, I talk about it. We need to not be afraid to talk about these discussions. No topic should be so sacred that we can't take it and, and shine some light on it and look a little bit deeper. And so th that would be the first thing would be just to, to, to look at it, examine it, talk about it at, at scale. So people can say, what's the harm that's being done and what can we do about it? Engage in the conversation both online and in person would be the first step. All right, thank you so very much. And with that, we're going to switch into our normal Q&A. Oh, it unplugged. Yeah, the mic just unplugged. Dang it, James. You know about that. Oh, shoot. You got to knock all that over here. Uh -huh. You might have to hunch to talk into the mic. And with that, the floor is all yours for the second question. Just to be sure we've got it. Oh, good, thanks. Okay, yeah. Um, this question kind of for both of you, because I, I found it odd that it wasn't to the end you asked him for a definition of intrinsic religiosity when that kind of seemed to be his whole case was on those distinctions. But, um, uh, and, and so maybe this, this might help uh, kind of open any question to both of you. You know, it used to be said that uh, playing violent video games led to violence or something like that. And what they ended up finding, what it was more along the lines of correlation, like you said, there's, it's kind of weird. Correlation seemed to be more that people who had a tendency to be violent were just attracted to playing violent video games. Is there any kind of study like that that you've seen that people who are more violent tend to be Christian or anything of that nature that would revolve around that type of correlation? Yeah, like I, I talked about one of them with the, the meta-analysis where it showed that while there does seem to be a decline in violence connected to religiosity, when you take a third factor into account, which is you know, arousal levels, then that, that factor tends to disappear in the, the, the data. So like there, there are times all, you know, all throughout the social sciences where you'll have an external factor that um, is what's to account for and that there is no causal connection. Um, the, the reason that I, I waited to till the end with the intrinsic religiosity, you, know, you brought it up at the very end and I wanted, to, I wanted to go a little bit deeper with it, but we'll have to at another time, I think. So I'm not aware of any studies that show that. So this, this question is for uh, Holy Kool-Aid. Um, my question is kind of like the first question is related, but goes a little, a little deeper than that. So from the outset of this debate, I was kind of confused as to what your impact is because I, I kind of, you know, because dangerous was defined so, uh, forgive me, but nebulously, um, I felt myself kind of asking, okay, 
usually, like, for example, if this was a debate about climate change or something, and you were saying, hey, climate change is a real thing, you would be advocating that we stop using fossil fuels, you know, stop using plastics, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the impact here? Like, well, like, if you're saying, like, as we showed through, the, as was shown through the debate, that, like, basically what you were saying was, if something can be taken and used to justify something bad, potentially, uh, then we should regulate it and, and do all this stuff. I was just wondering, like, like, how dangerous are you saying Christianity, and how far do we take this policing and regulating? What is it exactly, what exactly is your call to action? Uh, that's a really good question. I think my goal with this debate, because if, real quick, show of hands if, if people feel comfortable, how many people in here um, identify as religious? So a good, a good chunk of the audience. Um, now, my, my goal here is, and I know that this, this is going to go out online as well, is I have been living in the South now for a while, and I had, uh, my parents were missionaries. My parents were, you know, and I was very, very religious myself, you know, all growing up. And I know that oftentimes Christianity just gets a pass, or religion in general gets a pass, where there can be horrible things that are swept under the rug, and people will look the other way. A great example of this is the uh, child sex abuse scandals in the Catholic Church, and it's not just the Catholic Church. Now they're starting to see it in another denomination after denomination after denomination. And I don't think that we should have any sacred cows. I think that everything should be analyzed in question. And so the goal with this debate is not to necessarily say, hey, we, Christianity is dangerous in this specific way. We have to do, you know, enact this legislation or whatever. I just want people to become a little bit more open to that to realize that maybe there are things that need to be done, maybe there are uh, actions that need to be taken, or maybe there's certain beliefs that should be left in the, the dumpster pile of history. And I'm not saying your entire religion, I'm not saying you know which beliefs, but I'm saying that because there are some dangers, we need to be cognizant of it. So I guess raising awareness. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, first of all, I mean, what I kind of got is that anything can be dangerous to stupid people, you know what I'm saying? And second of all, uh, you know, I just noticed that your only argument was fake healing. And then you talk about the Catholic Church, but if you just, Jesus said to just follow his teachings, right? So how are Jesus' teachings uh, dangerous? If you read the Word of God and stick to the Word of God, stick to the Bible, how is it dangerous? Well, I mean, it, it depends, because obviously Jesus has a lot of different teachings, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of interpretations of them. Um, one example that I'll give you is when it comes to, you know, sex and sexuality, right? One major issue that we have, especially right here in this state, in the state of Texas, is that we do not have good science-based um, sex education in schools. We do not have the, it at the level that we need. And so if, if we could get comprehensive sex ed, ed in schools, you would see a reduction in teen pregnancy, a reduction in abortion, a reduction in STIs. These are all things that we all want. Like whether you're Christian or atheist, you want these things, right? And yet people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about sexuality. Part of that argument? comes back to the teachings of Jesus, talking about you know, sex and sexuality. Yeah, we got to so, supposed to wait till marriage. So he, he, takes it, he takes it from you know, where you have in, in the Old Testament, you have all these commands about, you know, uh, having you know, sex, committing adultery, homosexuality, et cetera, and he takes it to a whole new level. And he, all of a sudden there's shame simply around thought crime. You look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. He's upped the, the, the stage to, to a whole new level that is, I don't believe that thought crime should be a crime. It don't matter what you are doing, it matter what Jesus okay. is. Okay. You gotta move on to the next question. Thank you, right. you don't know what you talked about. Get out of here. I'm glad I was able to make the debate out. There was a barn burner next door yesterday. It was really great. Um, but uh, my a barn burning, a barn burner. Oh, barn yeah. burner. It's an analogy. I mean, it's Texas. Uh, oh, thing. okay. Um, but my only. I thought God tried to smite me and mess. <laughs> uh, I, had a... I guess the question was uh, when I became an atheist. Uh, it wasn't so much a question of when I started going through different uh, religions. Um, a lot of them, the kind of the key was if I, if I stayed or I go, it was no really consequences. But the only thing I did see with Christianity is, I don't know if you guys, is, isn't it still dangerous not to believe in Christianity if, by your belief? If it's dangerous to not believe in Christianity? Good question. I mean, that, that is a very complicated thing. And I would say not necessarily, because again, you can be a good Muslim, you can be a good atheist. That doesn't mean you're going to be a danger to society. 
And I think this gets back to our understanding of what dangerous means. Most of the people in this room we would not say are dangerous, even though they may have done bad things, uh, may have said weird things, may have caused harm to other people. But we would not conclude from that you're dangerous because you have done uh, bad things. So no, I would not say because there's a difference between something being true and something being helpful. For example, uh, Ptolemaic astronomy is very helpful for navigation. It was for many years. It wasn't dangerous, but it was incorrect. So you could have an incorrect worldview and still not be dangerous. So that's a very important point here. Uh, we would not conclude anyone here, like yourself, if you're an atheist, is dangerous just because you may have done bad things or you're not a Christian. That's not what dangerous means. If the standard of judging something is the level of danger, if something is somebody is misapplying it, then everything is dangerous. I suggest that the ratio between goodness versus evil of what comes from it is a better judgment, better method of judgment. If you apply that ratio method, then I think Christianity is the greatest thing that ever happened to humankind. Don't you think that looking at Christianity only to the danger it can promote? Uh, then you are applying a single variable solution to a multivariable problem? Oh, that's a good question. I think that the goal of this debate, both for, for myself and, well, I'm not sure about for Michael, I can't speak for you. Um, because the topic of the debate was, is Christianity dangerous? And because so many people who I encounter will look the other way altogether. I'm stressing that we have to accept that there are dangers. Now, I'm not willing to grant that the good outweighs the bad. I, I've barely scratched the surface with, obviously I ran out of time you know, in, in showing some of the harm that's caused. And, and I can tie them back to Bible verses. Now, you could say that those aren't caused by the religion. You could say that those are misinterpretations of it. Or you could say that there's tons of great things that are done because of it as well. And I'm, I'm happy to, to take a look at that too. But I think that once you start to get to the point where you're, you're not willing to look at the, the bad at all, that's a really dangerous place to be. So if we can be a little bit more open to you know, looking at the danger and looking at the harm and, and understanding it and accepting it and seeing why it happens, then it's like, okay, now, then we can start doing a cost-benefit analysis and seeing you know, does the harm outweigh the good. Now here's the, the, the number one area, and I, I don't want to take too long on this answer, but the number one area where I think I would push back on you is that it's not just that Christianity is a collection of ideas. If that was the case, I'd be like, it's just like you know, with Plato, Aristotle, you know, any kind of philosophy, like you can take the good ideas and discard the bad. Where I think that the danger really comes into play is that people see the entirety of it as divinely inspired. It's take it all or, or lose it all, right? And so like I, as an atheist, I can say, you know, is love your neighbor a good idea? Yes, I, I agree, it's a great teaching. You know, and I, I can look through you know, other verses and agree, and I can also look at the bad ones and discard them. So if I can get more people to kind of come to that type of a situation where they can take the good and, and be willing to not hold on to the bad and not say that it's all sacred and it all has to be accepted, I think that that's a better approach. You can always come talk to us after we're here. Um, okay. And he can take questions too. Not just no, like. no, you got this. You're good. Uh, well, for me, I guess, you know, when it comes down to like, why is, you know, why would Christianity be considered dangerous, you know, because for me and my experience with Christians, and like I think yours was too, you know, growing up as a missionary, uh, most Christians are good. I mean, obviously, like you got the Catholic Church, you know, there's, there's bad people within a good organization. So I guess my question is, does a few bad apples spoil the whole bunch, in your opinion, because there's a few bad Christians, do you think the entire Christian religion is dangerous? I think that Christianity is a very powerful motivator. It's, it creates a setting that can potentially be cult-like. And I want to make a distinction. I'm not saying all, all religion is cults but it's, it creates a setting where you're taught to accept something, oftentimes dogmatically, not always, and you're taught that this is sacred and in its entirety sacred. And so it, that's, that's a very, very dangerous uh, 
dangerous setting. What, what was the, the, the wording of the question well, again? It was basically like how, and I agree, you know, they call it sacred, sacred and, you know, it has been, uh, you know, adulterated by man. But I guess what I'm saying is, in general, Christianity, I think, is good. And I think, in, in, I'm not trying to call you disingenuous, but I think even you would admit that the majority of Christians are good. <laughs> that there's only, hey, dude, let's do this question, man. That, that there's only, a, um, I, I guess my question is that, you know, you're saying Christian's bad, and I know there is the Catholic Church, and there are a lot of examples of cult like Christianity, but I would say the majority, the majority, over 50% are good. Yeah, and, and that, that was, the, you know, thank you for, for the re refresher, but I think that most people in general are good people. I, I don't think that most people are serial killers or else we'd have a lot higher murder rates. I think most people are good people. I think most Christians are good Christians. And I think most atheists are good, good atheists. The problem is that because religion makes us susceptible to doing things that we wouldn't otherwise do, then it's, it's like the quote I believe by Steven Weinberg that says, without religion, you'd have good people doing good things and bad people doing bad things. For good people to do bad things they wouldn't otherwise do, it takes religion. And all right, I want to thank both Inspiring Philosophy and Holy Kool-Aid for joining us at DebateOcon 2022, and I am now... Thanks so much. That was a fantastic, rigorous debate. We have Please. closing statements. Yes. We are now going to hand it to their closing statements. Sit down. Um, we write back to Holy Kool-Aid for their up to five-minute closing response. As I stated in my intro, the topic of debate of the debate today is not, is religion beneficial? It's not, is Christianity beneficial? It's not weighing a cost-benefit analysis. The topic of the debate today is simply, is Christianity dangerous? In order to, de to determine that, I defined Christianity. Christianity is a broad tapestry that includes over two billion people on planet Earth. Christianity is the people. Now, I don't have to speak Christianese to convince people of that, but I could. I could say that it's a relationship, not a religion, and relationships are about the people, and I could go on. But I think we would all agree that when you, when you have an inclusive definition, you have a large number of people who are all taking this book to be their sacred holy book. Beliefs inform actions. I demonstrated that with, with this peer-reviewed meta-analysis showing that our beliefs inform our actions. Beliefs that are ingrained in us, deeply ingrained, deeply held, that are regularly repeated and, and heard and, and reinstated, we're more likely to act on than ones that, that aren't. The church is uniquely positioned to do this in a way that I can't think of anything else that does it quite like that. So we have beliefs that are strong, that are powerful, that we're told are divine and sacred. You have your motive. You have people admitting to their motive. You have people linking it back and tying it back, and you have harm that is being done at scale. Now, I'm not saying that all Christians are bad people. I'm not saying that you know it's, it's more bad than good. I'm not saying any of that. I'm simply saying we have to be cognizant of the dangers. We have to be more careful and we have to examine it and say, are there better alternatives? Can we take the good while discounting the bad? I say yes, because I say accepting the bad along with the good. Sure, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but let's not drink the bathwater. I mean, just eat the baby, but that's probably not. <laughs> that's a bad analogy. I think that we can accept the good that's in Christianity while throwing out the bad. And if we're not willing to throw out the bad, if we're not even willing to admit that there are dangers present, then we have a problem. I've demonstrated the problem, I've demonstrated the dangers, I've demonstrated the connection between the two, and I've shown that there is harm using the risk assessment scale that's used by the government of the United States, that's used by other governments, including the, the government of Canada, and I've shown that every single metric along that path, that Christianity fits it like a hand in a glove. Is Christianity dangerous? You damn well better believe it is. Now, what are we going to do about it? Thank you so very much, Holy Kool-Aid, for your closing statement. And with that, we are going to hand it over to Inspiring Philosophy for the closing statement. All right, well, thank you, Thomas. I think it was a great conversation. Thank you all for coming out. And thank you, Modern Day Debate. Uh, let's start with the story. You go to Yellowstone, there is a place called Sour Lake. They have fenced it off because it's dangerous. If you go in, you will die. Okay. You know what's right by it is there was a, was a walk path made of wood. There are no signs saying the walk path is dangerous because you could trip and hit yourself. 
So if Christianity was really dangerous, we would try to mitigate it, control it, contain it, get rid of it. Uh, we would advocate for change or whatnot. I think the problem here is we're confusing real danger with potential danger. The debate is not, is Christianity potentially dangerous? The debate is if Christianity is dangerous. And so far, we've seen no good, strong evidence that anything uh, bad is coming from Christianity when we start looking into the data and the science. Okay, anything is potentially dangerous. I feel like we're having two different debates here up there. I'm trying to show what the actual data shows currently in reality. It does not lead to the idea Christian religiosity is dangerous. In fact, it shows the opposite. It's actually quite beneficial. Uh, just because there is a potential danger there for something, that doesn't mean it is necessarily dangerous. That doesn't mean it is dangerous. We need to be very careful here to see the difference between potential danger and actual danger. Uh, and if there was really a danger, we would be, we'd see more atheists advocating for things like control of Christianity, trying to get rid of it. Now, that may not be the best thing because I do see, now that I think about it, I do see some atheists actually trying to do that. But again, atheists also are pretty clear they want to go on what the science says. And the science is pretty clear that if you want to get rid of things like Christian nationalism, right-wing authoritarianism, get, them, get Christians to be more religious, as I showed in the studies. Uh, get them to focus more on what they actually believe and get to the core tenets of their faith, because that shows it actually makes them a better person. Gets them away from making politics their god, so to speak. Uh, that kind of idea. So if you want uh, a better world, you should actually be encouraging Christians to go to church more, to uh, uh, be more involved, to actually believe what they preach, and not use Christianity as religious symbolism to promote some sort of political ideology. Again, we cannot confuse a potential danger with what is actually dangerous. A real danger is something like Sour Lake, or it's like walking onto a geyser. Uh, these chairs are not dangerous. All of you humans in here are not dangerous just because you may have done bad things. That doesn't make you dangerous. There is potential for you to do bad things in the future. I would not conclude you're all dangerous. I would conclude there is potential there, sure. But again, the debate is on if it is dangerous, not if it is potentially dangerous. And with that, I'd like to conclude. I'll thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Thomas. This was fun. Thanks.